Um, so yeah, tonight I'm going to talk about uh, attention for time series forecasting. Um, so I'll just hop right in. So um, one of my interests for a long time has been like incorporating more deep learning con uh, deep learning models in industry. Uh, and in particular in industry why you know, we've seen massive advances in NLP with things like hugging face transformers and um, the computer vision side, you know, ImageNet uh, and other related technologies like that to really improve computer vision. Uh, we really haven't seen widespread adoption of deep learning, particularly in the time series forecast, at least not in my experience and a lot of people that I've talked to in industry. And there's been some reasons for this. You know, in industry, like I've seen people generally prefer very simple kind of shallow models that are very easily explainable, like XGBoost, linear regression, profit, ARIMA, et cetera. Um, and usually these are like the go-to in 90% of the cases I've seen. I, I've heard various rationales. Some people, it's interpretability. We need this model to be really interpretable for time series to our stakeholders. Um, also ease of use. Not all data science teams might have the skill level necessary to try to train a deep neural network. And another big one is lack of training data. So why I think these are all like good rationales, uh, I do think like long-term we'll definitely see more, uh, we definitely should see more, you know, deep learning models incorporated into I, in an industry level and industry setting. So, and I think a very good candidate to do that is transformers. Um, you might wonder why, given how big and complex for it is, but on one level, it's really good at finding, you know, relevant time step, steps in the sequence for predicting. You can visualize um, heat maps of attention. Uh, that can help with some of the interpretability issues I just described. Uh, it also allows access to any part of the history. Um, and, you know, also, as I was just saying, you know, it's potentially very conducive for transfer learning. We haven't seen a lot of research conducted on that specifically, but from taking it, our understanding in natural language processing, uh, it would definitely be my guess in one area I'm actually actively exploring at the moment. If, you know, uh, if basically the transformer can work very well in a transfer learning context. Oh, and I did want to add one other thing. So yeah, as I said, before another big reason is also, you know, these models are very complex and the code structure is very hard to use. So another big thing, regardless of its, you know, transformers or LSTMs, it has to be, we have to have easier interfaces to fit time series data to these neural networks because otherwise they're just too cumbersome to use. Even if they have much better performance, no one's going to want to write out like 200 lines of code when they can just call model.fit with, you know, SK learn or something. So, um, that's actually it for one, some of my formal slides. I'm now actually going to do some quick looks at some papers, um, just kind of interactively. Um, so, um, so one of the thing, so one of the interesting things, really interesting things that came out recently was this paper enhancing the locality and breaking the memory bottleneck of the transformer for time series forecasting. Um, and so with that, essentially, um, I'm just going to mute Slack, actually, for a second, stop those pop-ups. Um, uh, so with that, one, one of the offers look specifically at using transformers for time series forecasting. They also came up with this kind of new idea of essentially using this mass multi-head attention mechanism. And with that, they looked at instead of just applying kind of a single kind of dot product, actually using a convolution in the multi-head attention mechanism. Um, and by doing that, they can capture the greater idea of kind of the temporal dimensions of the time series data, particularly when working with multivariate time series data. Um, obviously, there's more detail I could go into here, but I'm just trying to provide a very brief overview of kind of some of the interesting stuff going on in this space tonight. Um, so that was very interesting, uh, and they found that worked pretty well. Uh, on the kind of the memory side of it, they also found that these alternatives to like a full kind of self-attention dot product, one was this log sparse attention, and another was, um, was this restart attention, and basically by using these, they, 
just in very sh brief, you can reduce the memory footprint. So this was one of the very interesting research articles to come out of the last Neur NeurIPS conference on this kind of transformers for attention. Uh, another re kind of interesting article that I saw was this temporal fusion transformers. Uh, and one of the interesting things about this in particular is a lot of times in time series forecasting, you'll have both, you know, at certain time steps, you'll have both observed inputs uh, and unknown inputs. For instance, like the day of the week, you're going to know even several t time steps ahead, but things like, but say the thing you're actually forecasting, you're obviously not going to know that. So th this, this model kind of provided an interesting framework for combining all these static covariates with you know this dynamic temporal data. Um, as I said, the architectures here are pretty quick, but I did just want to kind of survey those fairly uh, briefly. So one of the thing, the main thing I've been working on for the last couple of months is actually this kind of generalized framework um, for using for using transformers, uh, particularly um, transformers, but also other deep time series models. Uh, for for time series forecasting so so initially this was actually geared mainly towards stream and river flow forecasting because that's one of my main interests but i've been working on trying to expand it to other areas as well um as i'm doing right now with kind of like some of my covid research but the idea is it essentially integrates directly with weights and biases within it we have you know all these different variations of the transformer model um, that we can easily use for time series forecasting like here's a full simple transformer there's a custom transformer um, and basically the way it works is in general we uh, what we have with this is we'll have a custom configuration file and this integrates very nicely with weights and biases because when i go to log the training run it logs this full configuration file with all my different parameters you know what optimizer i'm using how many time steps I'm forecasting ahead, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I don't know exactly how well I'm doing in, on time, but I assume Lovana would know, let me know if I'm getting close to the end here. So um, I will go and show you some of my actual runs from using this kind of framework on time series data. So uh, you're doing great. You can use another five minutes or even 10 if you want. Okay, sure. That, that's great. Yeah, I, I just forget. It's kind of hard because I didn't remember what time I actually started at. But thanks, Lana. So um, so yeah, as you can see here, this works very well with weights and biases. Um, you know, I'm able to log. So this this is still on my other river flow forecasting task since that's what I was working on for very a while. So I here I log you know the cubic footage per second on the test, the temperature, um, and then the precipitation. Here's my training loss plots. Um, this model, for whatever reason, wasn't doing very good. So here's my actual predictions versus the actual flow. Um, obviously, that could be could use some more hyperparameter optimization. Um, so, but in any case, um, and you know, here's my full config file. So it works very nice and clean in this context. So. So, and, and particularly because transformers and other models like these have so many hyperparameters, this is where I think is a good potential in a and Because using sweeps, we can look at, you know, obviously things like batch size, we can vary with forecast history um, and forecast length and to, to understand how that will affect, you know, our final loss and all these other sorts of metrics. So that's actually what I've been looking at so far on some of the coronavirus forecasting research. Um, if you're not familiar, I'm actually working as part of the Corona Y group right now, which is, um, you know, this global group to uh, help uh, help with both on the NLP side, and now I'm working on the time series forecasting side, use AI to, you know, help fight coronavirus, which is obviously a very good mission. So one of the major problems for this sort of stuff with Corona Y is, we obviously have a very limited, very, very, very limited time series data set. So this is really a case where we really, if we want to use deep learning on this type of problem, we really need transfer learning and also data augmentation techniques. We also need very good hyperparameter searches. So uh, 
I'll actually be pretty honest right now. At this moment, I'm primarily uh, most of my baselines I've used are actually LSTM models. I am planning on getting to the actual transformer here as well, but I just wanted to do a baseline LSTM method. Method, but as you can see here, I'm already beginning to run like parameter sweeps to determine kind of the best batch size, the best learning rate, and the best sequence length, etc., and how that corresponds to the mean squared error and you know forecasting the number of coronavirus cases. And uh, we can see that definitely by using these parameter sweeps, I, I really do like this tool because I can very quickly see what types of things are working well. Um, and similarly, like. If we go um, down to the media section, um, well, that might not be loading right now, but I've, I've been loading the similar plots of cases versus actual case, cases there. Uh, I think I might actually be somewhat overloading my browser between the video and this right now. But, uh, but you would see like if this loads essentially the plot of the predicted cases versus the actual ones. Um, yeah, so like here, so here's the model's predicted cases. Those are the act um, actual cases. As you can see, it's not the best model, but this is just the very simple LSTM baseline with hyperparameter optimization. And we're definitely gonna add in some transfer learning on some similar pandemic data sets that's hopefully going to very much improve the performance um, of, of these models. So, um, so yeah, I guess that's kind of an overview of what I'm doing and kind of some of the research I'm looking at to hopefully bring, bring you know, deep learning really to the forefront of time series forecasting as a whole. Because I do think there could definitely be a similar type of image net or image net or BERT moment for time series forecasting where, you know, we have a massive pre-trained transformer model or even um, possibly an LSTM model that historically hasn't worked but i do think kind of the future in that area too is for deep learning and uh yeah definitely um you know weights and biases and their platform and their hyper parameters is making it easier to kind of plot course and you know see what works and what doesn't um so does anyone have uh any questions about that that pretty much covers what i wanted to go over tonight um another kind of presentation on short notice so i didn't have really refined slides or anything I feel like I always ask Isaac to present two days in advance. I'm like, hey, can you present at this event? And he scrambles to get it back together. Um, so we do have a question. If you guys have more questions, please ask in the Slack. Uh, and Sayak, maybe you can post the link to the Slack community again. Um, so someone asked, could you talk about how you use configs for your project and weights and biases? Do you keep all your configs in the OneDB.config object? I love a question about weights and biases. Um, sure. So yeah, I have I have different configuration files. So actually, this platform uses essentially different um, configs to to run and initialize the models. So actually, the models are primarily initialized to for dictionaries. So basically, if I wanted to change the model I wanted to use, I would just change this to like you know an LSTM or something like that. And so I do store like different groups of this JSON data. So for instance, this config is for like a full simple transformer model. This config is for an LSTM. And then what happens is, is uh, when the models are initialized, this is logged straight to um, fndb.init command. So this config is passed to that. Um, and yeah, I'm actually still in the process of fully integrating the hyperparameter search with these configs because these configs are very complex, but that's definitely on my radar to like kind of fully integrate um, their hyperparameter searches, which are pretty good with my full kind of config initialization architecture. Um, and then another thing I do is I do just store like the config files in JSON format. So I have a number of JSON configs that I can just download. Um, uh, and I and I use some of those for unit tests too. So here's like an LSTM in the full JSON format. Here's a full transformer config. Um, anyways, that probably answers more than answers your question, but it's kind of. Uh, thank you. Uh, so someone else asked, um, how uh, how are your models comparing to standard um, epidemiology models? I guess have you tried comparing them? Benchmarking. 
Yeah, so right now we were, are working at looking at the the LSTM model in particular, because I said that's the main one I've run so far versus a standard um, SEER model. Um, so, so far, um, pretty, pretty similar. And the SEER model, I think, was still outperforming the LSTM a bit. Um, but as I said, we haven't really tried transfer learning or any of these other techniques. Um, on it yet but yeah i'd def definitely be interested to see like long term once we get like kind of a full transfer learning data set and other data augmentation techniques to see how that compared with it um plus we're potentially even weighing maybe using some of those very basic mathematical models for data augmentation techniques so we would like just pre-train on data generated by them and even though that isn't the best that could provide like an initialization which we then fine tune on all of our um on the actual data so uh so oswald asked uh do you have any thoughts around using reformers with time series data yeah i think the reformer is very interesting um it's a very uh i i think it has a lot of potential for time series too based on what i've seen i haven't personally gotten around to implementing it i think it only came out what was it three or four months ago but uh yeah, definitely at some point I'd really like to add it to my library and see how it performs. Uh, have you tried uh, transformers? And you mentioned that you hadn't gotten around to them yet. Um, so can you uh, share the code with people? Because a bunch of people ask for your GitHub repo. Uh, and then also, would you come and give this talk again once you've tried transformers and reformers? Um, yeah, yeah, I can definitely share the code, um, at least, yeah, for our kind of uh, uh, Corona Y models. And yeah, I'd be happy to <laughs> talk again at some point if people are interested.